Albert Einstein was one of the most accomplished and celebrated scientists in all of history, and he gave us one of the most important theories of the world around us, general relativity. This theory explains how gravity works in a way that had never been seen before. It has passed practically every test it's ever been put through, and remains at the forefront of scientific research. It's still the best theory of gravity that we have, and is one of the most beautiful descriptions of how the universe works that we've ever developed. What's incredible is that Einstein won a Nobel Prize, but he didn't win it for this theory, and his Nobel description very obviously avoids mentioning it at all. In this video, let's talk about why his prize was so controversial, why it didn't include relativity at all, why it took so long for him to get the prize, and what he actually did win it for. Let's start with the why. Why did the prize take so long to come Einstein's way? Given that he was already a very well-respected scientist, and pretty famous for a physicist way before he got the prize. Well, he was finally awarded the 1921 Nobel Prize in Physics in 1922. But that's all part of the story and controversy surrounding his prize. We'll start with that story, and then get into the science that he won it for. Something called the photoelectric effect, which was apparently so much more worthy than general relativity. One of the best and most celebrated scientific theories of all time. We're talking about the early days of the Nobel Prize. The first ones were awarded in December of 1901 to mark the fifth anniversary of the death of Alfred Nobel, who left funding for the prize in his will. That's a story for another day. And the winners were chosen exclusively by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Four years after the first award, Einstein had what is now called his miracle year, when he published four separate groundbreaking papers. One of them explained Brownian motion, which isn't really too relevant to our story, but was still an incredibly influential paper about random stochastic movements. One of the papers introduced special relativity, proclaiming the speed of light to be a constant value, no matter the frame of reference of the observer, and dealing with some other intricacies of that theory. Ten years later, Einstein would go on to publish his theory of general relativity. The clue is in the name. This was a generalized version of special relativity, giving us the famous theory of gravity, explaining the force as space-time being bent by matter and energy. Space-time tells matter how to move. Matter tells space-time how to curve, as John Wheeler once so eloquently put it. It is a complicated theory when you get into the details of the equations, but it beautifully explains gravity in a pretty concise way. For now though, back to 1905 and the miracle year, and Einstein released another paper in which, as a consequence of his new special relativity theory, he derived the most famous equation in history, E equals mc squared. The fourth of the groundbreaking papers explained the photoelectric effect. In general, I would say that this is much less well known, but this is the only specific scientific discovery mentioned in the citation for Einstein's Nobel Prize. What an incredible year. Most physicists would break your arm off just for one of those papers. As a result of his miraculous year, his popularity and fame as a scientist rose rapidly, awarding him new academic positions and eventually nominations to the Nobel Committee. Now, at the time they're made, such nominations are private. But after 50 years, all nominations do become public. This means that we now know that Einstein began receiving Nobel nominations as early as 1910. And by the end of that decade, he was receiving more support and was being nominated pretty much every year, with his scientific reputation increasing even more with the 1915 paper introducing general relativity. However, Einstein and those supporting him for a prize had a couple of issues that were really hindering his prospects of a successful nomination. The first being that the prizes were solely decided by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and relied on expertise of those in the academy. This meant that ideas and innovations in mainstream popular and well-established fields had an enormous advantage over discoveries in new or less explored areas, and nominations in the latter case were much less likely to move forward, since relativity was such a groundbreaking and new paradigm. It took time for it to be well understood by the wider scientific community. 
The problem here is that after nominations were received by the Academy, it was members of the Academy that wrote up the summaries of the discoveries to be presented to the committee that eventually decided who won the prize. This meant that the understanding, biases, and even politics of the person assigned to write up the report had an incredible impact on the likelihood of the nomination being successful. For example, in 1920, a man called Svante Arrhenius wrote the report of relativity. It was a short report, mostly highlighting the lack of evidence that supported relativity. This was also under a backdrop of some anti-German campaigns in the wake of the First World War, although to be fair, it's not clear how much this would have influenced the report. In 1921, as the pro-Einstein arguments grew ever stronger, a stubborn but well-respected member of the Academy called Alva Gulstrand wrote a quite negative report about relativity. He suggested that the theory had many flaws, and once evidence he considered unreliable was ignored, he reported that anything left could be easily explained by classical mechanics. To quote him, relativity lacked the significance for physics for which an awarding with a Nobel Prize can come into question. For context, this man was himself a Nobel Prize winner, but in medicine. He was an ophthalmologist, and I don't think it's unfair to suggest that he did not have a great grasp on the details of the still new and cutting-edge theory of relativity. However, he was influential, and the Academy did not want to go against his report. And in fact, they determined that none of the nominees that year reached the threshold for winning the Nobel Prize in Physics, and they exercised their right to defer the decision and award the prize the next year, in 1922. The second hurdle for Einstein was that the rules for Nobel Prizes required a discovery to be tested by time, effectively meaning that there had to be excellent evidence confirming a theory or idea. This is in the hopes of avoiding the potential embarrassment of awarding a prize to a breakthrough that turned out to be incorrect in the long run. Again, this didn't help relativity at the time, since experiments confirming predictions of the theory didn't provide concrete evidence for its correctness until quite a few years later. Now, in 1922, Einstein was once again nominated for the prize, and more calls were saying that it would be unjust to award the prize to anyone else ahead of Einstein. That said, the Academy still didn't want to go against the report of the previous year, as they thought it would look disrespectful to Gullstrand, and few were willing to do that publicly. They did, however, concede that they needed to seek more expertise when deciding the physics prize. Theoretical physicist Carl Wilhelm Ossin was brought in. He was an Einstein supporter, having actually nominated Einstein for the prize himself in previous years. And he had a plan. He knew well of Gullstrand's issues and misunderstandings with relativity having actually discussed his reports with him in previous years, and had on those occasions attempted to point out his mistakes. But these corrections never did affect Gullstrand's final report on relativity. That report remained very negative. However, Osin also knew that Gullstrand would not change his mind, so he took a different approach in 1922. Instead of focusing on the groundbreaking relativity, in 1922, Osin nominated Einstein again, but focused the citation heavily on his other work, with the most emphasis on the photoelectric effect. This meant that he could try to get a Nobel Prize for Einstein, while avoiding the very topic that the influential Gullstrand objected to so much. This was a good plan, but it did have its own problems. To understand them a bit better, let's first talk about what the photoelectric effect actually is. In short, it's a process where shining light on a metal surface can eject electrons from that surface, and those ejected electrons are known as photoelectrons, giving the name to the effect. Sounds kind of straightforward, but it was incredibly surprising and hard to explain before Einstein. The rough idea is that he was trying to explain why shining light on metal can change the charge of the metal, and why only certain types of light can do this. The classic demonstration of this is to start with a charged piece of metal, normally achieved by rubbing it with a cloth or balloon, giving it loads of extra electrons, and hence making that metal negatively charged. You can see this by the way the charge causes the metal leaves of an electroscope to spread apart, or the metal to get held up in the case of this demo. If you then shine a normal lamp on the metal, nothing happens. No matter how bright it is or how long you shine it, it doesn't affect the setup at all. However, 
If you use an ultraviolet light though, bam, the metal loses the negative charge and it stops being held up as a result. This might not sound like a huge deal, but it was revolutionary. You see, the light is basically kicking those electrons off of the metal, and it needs a certain amount of energy to do that. If light acted as a wave, as we classically think about it, then energy should add up. If it didn't have enough energy to kick the electron off straight away, then either making the light brighter or shining it for longer would eventually deliver enough energy to move those electrons. But that doesn't happen. In this case, the electrons never get kicked off by the normal lamp. Einstein, though, proposed that light comes in little packets called photons, each carrying a specific amount of energy. If that energy is the right amount to kick off an electron, then it does so. If it's too low, then it can never move them. One photon hits one electron at a time. We can't explain the photoelectric effect if the light is a wave, but if it acts as a particle, then it makes total sense. I'll leave links in the description to more detailed explanations and demonstrations if you want to get more into the details of exactly how this works. Here, the UV light has enough energy to kick off those electrons, but the normal lamp just doesn't. It was a huge paper, but it relied on the brand new quantum theory of light, which many physicists were skeptical of at the time, this was another problem for Einstein in the Nobel race. At the time, quantum theories were not the tried, tested, and accepted theories they are today, so it felt like a similar problem that he had with relativity. That is, until Osin came up with his plan. Not only did he propose Einstein for the 1921 prize, remember this was actually being awarded a year late in 1922, but he also supported the idea that the actual 1922 prize should go to Niels Bohr for his work on quantum mechanics, specifically his work on the atom. You might have heard of the Bohr model of the atom, and that work was a big part of his prize. Osin highlighted the connections between the work of Einstein and Bohr, and this helped solve criticisms of both work. On the Einstein side, there were criticisms that the quantum theory his explanation of the photoelectric effect relied on were largely developed by others, and on Bohr's side that his work was not grounded in reality, but Einstein's results now showed it actually was. Osin managed to convince the committee that Bohr's prize would give credibility to quantum theory, especially when combined with the earlier 1918 prize that had gone to Max Planck, and that it meant that the basis for Einstein's work was no longer a problem, and he was free to be awarded a Nobel Prize too. That was a frankly amazing achievement, but there was one thing left to argue about the exact wording for the citation of Einstein's prize. After quite a lot of discussion and deliberately avoiding any possible mention of relativity, they settled on for his services to theoretical physics, and especially for his discovery of the law of the photoelectric effect. I think this clearly hints that relativity is part of the recognition, if you know, but they really don't want to say it. It is funny though, because at the award presentation ceremony, the chairman of the Nobel Committee for Physics, the aforementioned Svante Arrhenius, gave a speech and literally mentions relativity in the second sentence, so it was a bit all over the place. Either way though, Einstein got his prize, I think justifiably, even if it's not explicitly for what you might expect. Please feel free to leave me any questions or comments you have down below, and thanks a lot for watching. YouTube is really pushing the importance of likes and comments at the moment, so I would really appreciate it if you left anything down there to help out, and even consider subscribing too if you like, which helps out a lot as well, and is completely free. If you're interested in JWST mugs and merch, or animals in space merch, we have that available too at the link in the description, but no pressure on that one. Until next time, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye!